This morning we'll be looking at Exodus chapter 6, and we'll be looking at verses 2 through 9. Uh, but before we dive into uh, chapter 6 here, we've got to get an understanding of the historical context for where we're at in Exodus. Um, so where are we? Where are the Israelites here in Exodus? Where do they find themselves? Egypt. They're in Egypt. That's exactly right. And how did the Israelites get there? Do you remember? Joseph. Joseph, exactly. There was great famine in the land. His brothers sold him into slavery. And Joseph, taken by God's hand, as we see in Genesis chapter 50, that God was orchestrating all of this through his sovereignty, brings Joseph into Pharaoh's house. And Pharaoh places Joseph over everything in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. And it's here that as famine destroys the land, Joseph's family, the people of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, are brought into Egypt. They are given the choicest of lands. And it is here that our text says that Israel multiplies greatly, echoing promises from Genesis 12 that we'll get to. And, but it's here that also after this Pharaoh dies, Joseph has passed on, a new Pharaoh has come into power. A Pharaoh who no longer remembers Joseph, who no longer remembers the history of how the Israelites got there, but seeing their numerous capacities, seeing how they have come to be such a mighty people in the land, he decides we better enslave them. We better put them to bondage before they realize their greatness and overtake us as a people. And so they are enslaved. And they are enslaved for 430 years ruthlessly. And this is where we arrive at our text with Moses being sent to the people of Israel to come before Pharaoh to ask for their freedom. And you remember the story, Pharaoh, or Moses walks into Pharaoh and he has his staff in his hand and he throws down his staff and it turns to a serpent, right? And what do all of Pharaoh's magicians do? They do that too. They throw down a staff and it turns into a serpent. But what does Moses' staff do? gobbles them up. And then Moses picks his staff back up and he declares, this is Yahweh, let my people go. And what does Pharaoh say? He says, no. Why would I let these people go? I don't know your God. I don't know who this guy is. I have no intent of releasing my people, of releasing my slaves. He has an investment in them. And but out of fear that the Israelites will now revolt against him, seeing a possibility of them being let go, he, he doubles their workload. He takes away the straw from them. He makes them go find their own. He ruthlessly embonds them more and more to their slavery to the point where the elders of Israel come to Moses and they complain. They say it was better. It was better before you came, Moses. Why have you inflicted this upon us he says, now we stink in the eyes of Pharaoh. Israel is groveling for the scraps that are falling off the tables of those who get the scraps from Pharaoh. They have forgotten who they are. These are the children of God. These are the people of promise. The ones who have heard the stories of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Yet they have lost hope in the promise. We see in verse 9, it says that they have succumbed to the harshness of their slavery and bondage. And instead, instead of looking, looking forward to the deliverance of their hope, to the deliverance of their bondage, they have become broken and numb to it. I mean, go back into their history. Look at the promises. You know, coming, growing up as, a, as an Israelite, they heard the stories of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. They knew what had taken place in their history. Look in Genesis chapter 12. It says this. God says, And I will make of you, talking to Abraham, a great nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. They have heard this. Then, Genesis chapter 15 on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring, I give this land 
from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the land of the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephraim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. God promises it all to them. Then in Genesis 17, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. These Israelites, they knew the promises God gave to them. They had heard the stories over and over they knew that God's deliverance was coming. I mean, look in Genesis chapter 15, 13. God had even told them in their bondage. He tells them, is that up there, Chris? Pay attention. There we go. Genesis 15, 13, it says, Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. God had told them specifically, I am going to redeem you. You will be enslaved for 400 years, but I will redeem you. But as we'll read in verse 9, because of their broken spirit, because of the harshness of the slavery that Pharaoh had inflicted upon them, they had lost sight of these promises. They had lost sight of the God who had promised it to them. So let's stand and let's read together God's Word, Exodus chapter 6. This is God's Word. Exodus 6, verses 2 through 9. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Lord Jesus, we pray this morning that as we come, we come as people who have been redeemed, who have been freed from our bondage. Yet, Father, so often I know in my own heart I forget. I forget what I've been brought into. And I pray that this morning that through our study of your word that your Holy Spirit would speak clearly to us and that, Father, our hearts would be changed and shaped into that which you have called us to be, sons and daughters of the living God. We pray this in the name of Jesus. You may be seated. You know, it's interesting. You'll look in your Bible, and e even on your, on your phone, if you're on your phone, uh, when you look at, verse, when you look at uh, verse 2, it says, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. And you'll, and you'll see that in your Bible it says capital L-O-R-D, right? Does everybody's Bible say that? The reason that you find that in your Bible today is because in the Hebrew Bible, the word that's written in Hebrew is Yahweh. And after the 6th century, after Israel had already been in the Promised Land, they've now been taken off into captivity, into Babylon, into Assyria. They realized and they learned about all these other gods that people serve around the world. They also learned from these other cultures that to know the name of a god is to have power and control over that god. And so the Israelites, for reasons 
to demonstrate that God is the only God above all gods, but also out of, out of, out of fear for not, uh, for not violating the third commandment, not committing blasphemy against the Lord's name. When they met in their temples for worship, they spoke the word Adonai, which is the Hebrew word for Lord. And then and as the Septuagint came into play in the Greek, they used the word kurios, which is Lord. And what it gave was this concept uh, that we are, God's name is so sacred and so holy that we aren't even going to speak his name. And so they changed it from Yahweh to Adonai. And so that's why you see it in capital L-O-R-D, um, which I think is pretty interesting in our context because here what we find is that God comes and he explicitly gives his name to his people. You know, Abraham, it says that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they knew who God was. You know, they saw God's mighty power. You read from Genesis 1 all the way through Genesis chapter 50, and you see God at work. You see him showing himself present in the lives of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But it says that by his name, he did not specifically mention himself. They didn't know him as Yahweh. They knew him as Adonai, as Elohim, as God. But here, in the Exodus, as they are coming to the end of their slavery, God chooses to reveal himself as Adonai, as Yahweh. Why? Why here? It's really interesting. Um, you know, we've been, we've, we've read all the way through Genesis already. You know, our, actually, our, our Grace 90X Club, I know there's still some of y'all that are hanging in there. Uh, we're all the way through, we're into Second Chronicles and on now. We're cruising. Um, but now you've read through Genesis and, and it's get to Exodus and God reveals himself as Yahweh. Why? You know, we're looking at this in our college Sunday school class, and I apologize to those of you that are in my Sunday school class. You've probably already heard this. Um, but we're studying creation, but we started with the Exodus. Why would we start with the Exodus if we're studying creation? Who wrote Genesis? Moses. And who did he write Genesis to? Israelites. And where were the Israelites when he wrote Genesis? In the desert. They are on the other side of the, of the Red Sea. They had just been redeemed by this God named Yahweh. He had just inflicted Egypt with plagues. He had just parted the Red Sea. They had come across and he had swallowed up the armies of Pharaoh. And all of a sudden, they're sitting on the other side. They're sitting on the other side of the, Egypt, of the Red Sea going, what in the world just happened? I mean, just imagine yourselves. You've been creating, you've been serving gods in Egypt. You've been building the temples for these different gods in Egypt for 430 years. All they did was sit there. All they did was stand there in stone. They never moved. They never talked. And all of a sudden, here's a God who gives him his name, and he acts. He moves. He speaks. He has power. And it's in this context, it's in this context of Israel's bondage, in the context of all these gods being worshipped, that Yahweh comes to his people and he reveals himself to them personally. And we see that following these promises, immediately following chapter 6 in Exodus, what begins to happen? Pharaoh tells him no. And so God says, okay, now I'm going to show you who I am. Now I'm going to display my power. And on the first plague, Yahweh turns the Nile River into blood. Which, you know, that seems really gross. And it's, 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 it says that it, the Nile is a source of life. And so basically Yahweh is saying, I'm cutting off your source of life. But beyond that, he was defying the gods of Egypt, the gods Canum the gods Happy, the gods Osiris. These were the river gods, the gods of the Nile. And so Yahweh says, not only am I defying Pharaoh, but I am defying each and every single one of your gods as well. They're the gods of the river, now their river is death. Look on the day two. Day two he sends frogs. The goddess Hecht in Egypt was depicted as a frog. So God sends them defying the god of Egypt, Hecht. We get into the plagues of locusts, of gnats, of flies, and of boils. 
And we see it destroys the fields, it ruins their crops, it ruins their livestock. And God is making a mockery of the gods of Egypt, Seth and Isis. Hail is brought upon Egypt, putting shame to the Egyptian god, Mut. And then in the ninth plague, the ninth plague, which was what? Darkness. God says, I have defied all the gods of Egypt. I have defied Pharaoh himself. And now I come after the god Ra, the sun god, the god by which the Egyptians believed men came from the tears of Ra himself. And God blocks out the sun, not only defining, defying Pharaoh, but he defies one of the highest gods of Egypt. And by his acts of the plagues, God demonstrates that he is the only true and living God. There is none other but Yahweh himself. And it is this Yahweh who comes to his chosen people, Israel. It is Yahweh who descends from his throne and has taken intimate joy and delight in those whom he has called his children and his people. It is Yahweh, Yahweh, who then by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire leads them out of Egypt. It's Yahweh who parts the Red Sea. It's Yahweh who delivers them again from the hand of Pharaoh, swallowing up his army. It is Yahweh who through Moses, he reveals himself and his chosen people through the writing of the Pentateuch. And it is Yahweh here with the Israelites on the other side of the river. They receive Genesis and they read Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God. And when they read that, it's not just some random God. It is Yahweh, the one who had just brought them out of Egypt, the one who had just defied every single Egyptian God. This God has power. This God has truth. And it's in this context that the true and living God, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, that Yahweh here in chapter 6 reaffirms his covenant promises with Israel. But beyond that, he reaffirms his covenant promises with you. Because as we see in the New Testament, in Romans, you and Hebrews, you have been engrafted into Christ. You and I have been adopted as the sons and the daughters of God. And so his covenant promises that he makes to Abraham are for you too. And so here God is reaffirming his covenant promises for us today. And we are going to look at three promises that God makes to us as his redeemed people. The first is that God promises redemption from bondage. God promises redemption from bondage. Secondly, God promises redemption into blessing. Redemption out of bondage into blessing. And then God promises redemption through and in the context of intimacy and family. So let's look at God's first promise in verse 6. Look at verse 6. It says this, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. God says, I will bring you out. It is by my name, Yahweh, the power of the only living and true God, that I will bring you out of bondage. I will redeem you. God promises Israel that he's going to deliver them from their bondage in Egypt. But what we see here is a foreshadowing, a foreshadowing of the redemption that was to come through Jesus Christ. When we study and look at the Exodus, what we have to understand is that the Exodus serves as a model for redemption a model of redemption as deliverance from oppression and reception into divine blessing. And we see the ultimate display of this redemption in the Exodus. Where do we see it? At what point do we see the ultimate point of redemption in the Exodus? It's the parting of the Red Sea, right? They're pinned down, nowhere else to go. Tell them, Moses, we wish we were back in Egypt because it was so much better when we were there, already complaining. And God redeems them and swallows up the army. And what we see is this pattern of redemption through water being set. 
Israel is delivered out of Egypt onto dry ground through the Red Sea. And then remember, remember as they get into, into, into the book of Joshua, as they're coming into the promised land, how do they enter into Canaan? Across the Jordan River. God parts the river and they cross through on dry ground again. God is promising redemption. And we see that. Where if when we back up, let's talk about redemption through water. Back up a little bit in Exodus. Um, who was the hero? Uh, in this story, not necessarily the hero, but what instrument did God use in the Exodus? Who was it? It was Moses. Can you think of how redemption came in Moses' life through water? His rescue, his birth, right? Pharaoh, Pharaoh realizes that Israel's coming too strong, so he declares, hey, all you midwives, when they give birth to a male child, you kill it, because I am not going to have Israel overtake me. And so they take Moses and they put him in a basket and they send him down the river. And through God's sovereign hand and control, he delivers them. He delivers Moses. He redeems him. Back up even earlier. Where else in the Old Testament? We go back further. Before Moses, where do we see redemption? Through water. Noah. We see Noah in the flood. We see God redeeming his people, promising not to curse them, not to wipe them out forever, but remembering his promise and his covenantal faithfulness to them. Let's go later in the Old Testament. There was a prophet who was delivered through stinky water. Jonah, thrown overboard, fleeing from God, not, not, not embracing his promise and the promise of who God is to him, but fleeing from him, and God delivers him through water, through a fish. And then when we get to the New Testament, we see the Exodus set as the pattern of redemption as it comes to fruition in the life of Jesus Christ. Think about Moses' life and now think about Jesus. What happened at the birth of Jesus? What was declared in the, throughout the whole land at Jesus' birth for fear of Jesus? Kill him! We're going to find him and kill him. And so Joseph and Mary take Jesus and they flee to Egypt. And we see Jesus' flee to Egypt and his return out of Egypt, symbolizing him as the new Moses the new lawgiver. And then in John chapter 1, verse 29, as Jesus begins his public ministry, we see Jesus coming down to the river to be baptized. Right? And John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, and he declares this. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. What is this a reference to? The Passover the Exodus, when they took the lamb and they slaughtered it and they painted the blood on the doorposts, John recognizes that Jesus is the promised redeemer, the one who's going to deliver them. He is the Passover lamb. And then we get into Matthew chapter 26 at the Lord's Supper where Jesus, on the night before he will be crucified, he says that this is the new covenant replacement for the Passover. Jesus Christ declares, he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And this is the third cup of the Passover that Jesus is drinking. The cup of redemption, signifying is Egypt, Israel coming out of Egypt. And Christ takes that and he says, it's no longer about Israel coming out of Egypt. It is now about me redeeming my people. And then we see in the New Testament, we see baptism. Baptism as the new covenant fulfillment, fulfilling of the water theme of redemption, being symbolized as immersion into the presence of God, cleansing of our sins and entrance into the community of faith. And brothers and sisters, this is what Christ has done for you. This is what Yahweh has done for you. Romans chapter 6 says that you were once enslaved to your sin so that we would no longer be enslaved to our sins. Christ died for you. Just as God delivered Egypt from the bondage of slavery, so too Christ has delivered you from your bondage to sin and death. But, probably, just the same way as when Israel approached the Red Sea, saw they were pinned down, as Israel is wandering in the desert, hungry, thirsty, complaining, Oh, if we could only be slaves again. It was so much better. At least we had food. At least life was good. So too, 
I know it's true for me, we often cling to our past bondage. We often desire to remain enslaved to that which we have been brought out of. You know, I've got my son Eli. He's, uh, he'll be one, I don't know, next week sometime. And, uh, which is crazy, because uh, when he was born, we were still planning on going to Columbia. And uh, now we're here. When he was one, uh, or now since he's been born, one of his favorite things is in my wife. This is something she hates about me. This is confession time. I walk in the house, and I take my sandals off anywhere, and I leave them there. It's a fault of mine. She hates it. I hate it, but I do it. Uh, and our son Eli has this weird fetish for eating sandals. And so it doesn't matter where I take them off at. Somehow, as soon as they leave my feet, he makes a beeline and he starts chewing on that gross, stanky sandal. And it doesn't matter how many times we take it away from him. No matter where we hide it, he pursues that sandal. He has to have that sandal to chew on. It doesn't matter how gross and disgusting. He has to chew on it. Now replace that sandal with the sin in your life. How often do you run, do you seek out, do you hunt down that which is, you know is gross and nasty in your personal soul? And you know it, brothers and sisters, because you've been brought out of slavery. You know it because God has redeemed you, because the Holy Spirit convicts your soul that then tells you that this is gross and nasty. Yet you run for it, you look for it, you want to have one more solid chew on that gross and nasty sin. And this is where we get to the second promise that God makes to Israel. Because you see, redemption is much more than just a freeing you from your bondage. It's much more than just a coming out of something. But redemption is always a coming out of something and a going into something. For the Israelites, it was a coming out of, bra- out of slavery and a bringing them into the promised land. You see, this initial act in Exodus is exactly that. It's just initial. God has so much more to come. And for all believers, for you, salvation is so much more than just deliverance from your sin and your guilt and your death. But it is also a going into the promises and the abundance that God has for you. God desires to be in a relationship with you and community with you. And he wants to bless that community. And so redemption is always a coming out of our bondage and a coming into the promise and the abundance of which God has given us. Look in verse 8. Read verse 8 with me. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. And so there's not only deliverance from oppression, but there's hope, a hope of giving of what they're going into. You know, God doesn't just walk up to to the Israelites, deliver them out of Egypt, and then walk away. No. God has a long-term vision for his children. He has a vision of blessing and abundance and of promise. You know, I, uh, I saw, I was watching a pastor the other day, and I really liked what he talked about. You know, so many of us, when we, when we uh, go through our day-to-day lives, you know, we, we're, we're focused upon this little green strip here. You know, you're born right in here. You go through middle school, through high school, hoping you'll meet the right girl, maybe, someday to be your wife working hard to get good grades so that you can get into the college that you want to right about here. And the whole reason you want to get into a good college here is so that you can get a good job, get married, have a nice house, a wonderful family right through here. And you work your tail end off all through here, worrying about how everything's going to work out so that right in here, you can have an incredible retirement and you can enjoy the good things of life. But brothers and sisters, what we so often forget is all of this. We focus so much on accomplishing this that we forget what we have been brought into. We forget that we have been brought into eternity with God, that we have been brought into all of this abundance, all of this promise. Yet we cling and we strive and we pursue our lives after what's on this little line because our perception of what we've been brought out to is limited because we forget so often about what we have been brought into 
that God through his son, Jesus Christ, has delivered you out of bondage and he has brought you into promise. He's brought you into eternity. He's brought you into a blessing forever. He declares that you, that I, am righteous. Righteous because of Christ, because of his righteousness given to us on our behalf that we are brought out of sin and blessing. And brothers and sisters, so far too often we limit our salvation only to the negation of our sins, to the removal of them, to the fleeing of evil. But simply removing our sins does not gain us righteousness or redemption. Simply turning 180 degrees from the path you're headed and running the opposite direction doesn't mean that you're not going to run into some other form of evil in the other direction. The Christian life is never only about negation, but it is about promise and blessing and the abundance of what we are being brought into. You know, there was a study that was done a while back, and it looked at 65, people that were 65 and older. And, and I hope this isn't too uh, depressing. I mean this very sincerely to our older congregation. Um, but they looked at people that are 65 and older knowing that they were in the last stage of their life. And they looked at them and they asked them, if you could do anything, if you could change anything in your past, what would it be? And they were shocked because the overwhelming majority of their answers was, I would have worried a lot less. I would have worried a lot less. When they got to the end, they realized that everything that they were worrying about, everything that they were striving for, everything they were trying to pursue on that little green line, honestly, it didn't really matter in the end. And for us as believers, when we understand what we are being brought into, it changes, it changes us. And it changes how we live our lives today on that green line. And this is the third promise that God makes to us. Our redemption is not only deliverance from our bondage or bring us into a blessing, but it is a blessing. It is, it is all done through the context of intimacy and family in Christ. This is God's promise to you. God promises that he's not only going to bring you out, but he promises that he is going to be with you in the context of an intimate, familial relationship. Here in our text, God promises himself to us by his name, Yahweh, the power of the true and living God. He says, I will be with you. God forever binds himself to you and to me in this relationship and he reaffirms the covenant that he made with Abraham. I want you to look at the language that he uses here. You know, December 31st, 2004, I stood right here as David talked about last week and watched my bride come down to me. And she stood there, and my dad asked the question, Wes, do you take hope to be your wife? And I said, I do. And then in some act, miraculous, gracious act of God, he asked Hope, do you take Wes to be your husband? And I prayed, and she said, I do. Look at the language that God uses here. I will take you, I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. God is entering into a marriage agreement with you. And it's not based upon just some random God, but this is the God who has defied every other God in the land of Egypt. The God who has proven himself to be true and worthy and faithful beyond a shadow of a doubt. And he comes to you and he says, I promise myself to you. But I, what, is, what I want you to notice here is that throughout this entire passage, who is the condition of this promise upon? I made a vow to hope and she made a vow to me. But look at our passage. Look at the promises here. God says, now go to the next slide. I will bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. I will bring you to the land that I promised. I will give you that land. The guarantee of this promise, this marriage relationship, rests upon who? God. And God alone. God says, I take full responsibility for this relationship between you and me. And why does God do that? Because God knows. As Randy said yesterday in our new members class, 
God knows y'all are liars. God knows the hearts of man. He knows that if we are to enter into a promise agreement with God, we're going to drop it. We're going to fail. Because we still chase and pursue after those stinky, nasty sandals. And so God takes full responsibility of the promise upon himself. And we see that fulfilled in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. Because there was, there was wrath. There was payment to be made for your sin and mine. And so God being the guarantor of this promise to us. No responsibility is given to you. It is given upon Christ himself. So God takes his only son, Christ, and he sends him to die for you so that his promise may be fulfilled. So that the guarantee of his name, Yahweh, cannot be denied. Because what God promises to you is a bringing out of your enslavement and a bringing into abundance and blessing in the context of God as your father, in the context of every single person in this room as your, as your brothers, as your sisters, as one large family. God has redeemed you and he has redeemed me. So that when we look at this green line, who we are on this green line matters. Who we are here has eternal consequence. Because God has called you, he has redeemed you. You know, I used a line uh, the last time I preached with you, where light exists, darkness ceases. God has brought you into light. He has brought you into the promise, into the abundance of the redemption of Jesus Christ. And he has called you to live out your righteousness, the holiness that is now yours, given to you by Christ and as a, as a result of his promise to you. God has brought you out of bondage and redemption and into light. And so this week, remember, remember, brothers and sisters, what God has brought you out of. But more importantly, remember what God has brought you into. Because when we remember, when we remember what God has brought us into, when we look at this, when you think about this, your focus should be on this. Eternity. Life with God forever and ever. And so when you're worrying this week about your job, about your tests, about your marriage, about your children, just remember God's promise to you. It's eternal. It's one that will never be broken. God has proven himself faithful to you over and over again. He tells you, I will redeem you. I will be your God. I take you as mine. And I will bring you into the blessing and abundance that I have prepared for you. This is yours. Live your life this week remembering the promise that God has given to you, taking you out of darkness and bringing you into light. Let's pray.